I want you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. If we boast at anything at this church, we boast in only one thing, and that's the cross. Can I get an amen? Amen. We have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to us. We are dead men and women walking. Can I get an amen? Amen. What do I mean by dead man walking? I mean that you can kick the carcass. You can talk about the carcass, but the carcass doesn't respond to external influence because it is dead. (laughs) When you've been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified to you, you have one thing to boast about, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And so one of the most liberating experiences for a believer is when you realize that you can die. You can die while you're still alive. Are you following me today? You can die while you're still alive. The reason why you have anxiety is because you have not fully understood the extent by which you can die while you're still alive. Anxiety says the worst case is going to happen. What's worse than death? So when you die to self, you have nothing to prove and you only live for the cross. Amen? When you feel fear about what could happen, the impending fear about what could happen in your life, you suddenly get this reminder, I'm no longer alive, but there is one who lives in me and through me, and his name is Jesus. And so I don't do my own will, but I do the will of the Father. And so what we're going to talk about today, when you look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 14, is that we boast in nothing but the cross. We have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to us. It's such a liberating thing to learn how to die while you're still alive. It's such a liberating thing. You know, as I was preparing for this message, I was praying all week, and I said, Lord, there's so many things that are happening right now in the world, and specifically in the body of Christ globally in the earth. And as I begin to seek the Lord, you know, as the lead pastor of this house, we have five locations nationally. Many people tune in from around the world. I just spent a month in Europe where I was traveling and actually spending time not just with other people's church members, but V1 church members represented in Europe. And I said, Lord, there's there's a lot that's happening in the body of Christ. There's a groaning, there's an uncertainty, there's a confusion. And I said, Lord, What would you have me to say? There will be many people listening on Sunday. What would you have me to say? And the thing that the Holy Spirit responded very clearly is he said, Mike, the question that I'm asking my sons and daughters in this hour is what do they believe about the blood? What do they believe about the blood? It's not what you believe about a person. It's not what you believe about a situation. It's not what you believe. It's what do you believe about the blood? That is the question that's being asked of all Christians in this hour. Every son and every daughter of the Most High is being begged to answer the question, what do you actually believe about the blood? Y'all, I'm going to try not to preach this. I'm going to teach it. But I will tell you, Much of what we've based our salvation on has been inspiration and motivation, not transformation. Because when you understand the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a firm foundation for your salvation. And so we are going to go through a journey of understanding the blood of Jesus. And you know, I've taught on the blood several times before. And each time, have you ever cracked open a walnut and, and by hand? Do you remember back in the day where you couldn't buy a bag full of walnut meat? You had to actually crack the shell open. Are any old school folks in this church? And you had that steel and you would crack it open, your fingers would be hurt and you cut your hand just to get that little meat of a walnut. 
Sometimes when you're preparing a sermon, it feels like you're reading the scriptures and you're breaking through the shell of the external revelation to get to the meat revelation. And I've been preaching on the blood of the lamb for years now, and but I've never quite felt like I, I got to the meat of what the Lord wanted to reveal to me. And I'm telling you this week, after years, this thing was made known to me. And I got a revelation to share with you that I believe will change your life forever. But when, as we look at Galatians chapter four, verse 14, let me ask you a question. Do you feel that sometimes you get flashbacks of your past? Does the enemy place your past before you? Do other people place it before you? Do you feel somebody, sometimes tormented even by your past, tormented by who you used to be? Do you think about it often? Does it come to you in the realm of accusation? Do you hear the voice of accusation louder than the voice of God through the scriptures? And so if that's you today, I want you to get a revelation about the blood. What do you believe about the blood? We have to understand the blood. It's all about the blood. And I'm afraid that because, you know, pastors have been afraid, they have been intimidated by the idea of talking about the blood. It's gross. It's grotesque. It's eerie. It's weird. It sounds pagan. You know, you get somebody secular off the street at one of our locations right now hearing me talk about the blood. And they're like, that's weird. Am I right? And so what we've given the body of Christ is worship songs because, oh, you listen to music in the world, so listen to music here. We've given them inspirational messages because, oh, you listen to inspiration in the secular world. You have gurus and you have motivational speakers, so let's do that from the stage. But we have to talk about the blood now. It's time to talk about the blood and if you are a Christian and you have confessed your sins and you've asked to be forgiven, but you can't explain the blood, you don't have a full revelation. You don't really know what happened. So can I explain to you what happened? Can we go a little bit deeper as a church? So many people believe when you talk about the cross that you're talking about this one time when his blood was shed. And we think about him being pierced, we think, but I want you to understand that there was a sevenfold sprinkling of the blood of the lamb. And in the month of August, we are going to read the entire book of Leviticus together. Is anybody with me? Does anybody want to study the entire book of Leviticus through the month? Because I want to know who the real ones are. You know, by the time you get to August and you look at the attendance on Sunday, you know who the real Christians are. And I said, I want to go all the way deep in the book of Leviticus. I've waited almost 10 years of this church's existence to actually teach on the book of Leviticus. But what you see in the old covenant is that in order for there to be atonement for sins. So we talk about forgiveness, but we often don't talk about atonement. Atonement is when you make it right. See, forgiveness is in the realm of mercy, but atonement is in the realm of justice. Can I go deep today? So justice is you are justified. Pastor Mike, what does justified mean? It's before God, just if I had never sinned. What is biblical justification? How do you know you're justified? Because when the blood washes you, it's just as if I have never sinned. Justified. Who needed that? Now, before people, they'll always remember your sin. But before God, he'll say, it's as far as the east is from the west, and I don't remember it anymore. You are justified. It's just as if I have not sinned. That's not in the realm of mercy. That's in the realm of justice. It has been paid for. See, mercy is, I, I, you know, I'll release you from it. But justification is when you've been atoned and the price has been paid. The balance has been zeroed. Oh, come on. Somebody needs this word. So when you go back to the book of Leviticus, there were seven sprinklings of blood. Because how many of you know that there are different ways you sin? So there are different aspects and elements to salvation and freedom. So the seven sprinklings that happen are mirrored in the 
the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. And so what would happen in the book of Leviticus is that an innocent animal who never sinned because they cannot sin because they're instinctual. And, and you know, for as bad as I think my dog is, for as bad as I think Star is, he, Star is not capable of sin. He's a dog releva- relegated to instinct. So I don't know why he wants to eat my socks every day. <laughs> On Go- Google, they say that's because he loves me and they smell like me. But I'm tired of, so don't say aw. <laughs> You're lucky I let that mutt live in my house, feeding that worthless dog. He can't even attack an intruder. <laughs> worthless, can't even fetch a newspaper. <laughs> At least a baby, you change their diapers and then they go out of that season. I will be picking up poop till he dies. But the dog is instinctual. So we bought him this collar that beeps every time he barks so he'll stop barking. And you know what he found out how to do? How to rumble right before it triggers. So he knows the threshold right before it beeps now. And that's how we treat God. We toe the line of sin. How much can we get away with before it's sin? How much before we get called out by God? We've got to get a revelation of the blood. And so what would happen in Leviticus is an innocent animal that's governed by instinct that could not sin, the blood would be shed to cover and atone for those who are not innocent. And by the way, for those of you who still believe that human beings are born good, wait till you have your first kid. (laughs) And if you think that they're born a blank slate, wait till you have your first kid. So Psalm chapter 51 proves that we are all born into sin. And as a result of being born into sin, we all need a savior for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. And so Jesus came and this is what you need to get a revelation of is he was man without sin, not animal without sin. So Jesus did not just have instinct because we all have instinct as well. Nobody taught you how to make out with somebody, but you get in the right conditions and it might happen. (laughs) Julie's just going, oh. That's instinct. Instinct is what you're programmed to do. Listen, if I keep preaching two, three, four hours, your stomach's going to start rumbling and you're going to start seeking food because there's deep biological instincts that are wired into us. But the other thing that we have is intellect and we have a will, which means we have the ability to override our instinct by making choices. So to be born into sin means that your your will has been hijacked by a fallen nature and you cannot make the right choice even if your intellect knows what it is. That is the nature of a curse. Are y'all following me? The old covenant says that when when you sin, that the curse is actually transmitted to the third and fourth generation. And epigenetics teaches us that that musical abilities are transmitted in families, but also addiction. You can have a, um, a, a predisposition towards alcoholism. So when people ask me, is it wrong to drink? The question is, is it wrong for you to drink? <laughs> Because what have you inherited, even in your pre, uh, your, your pre genetic, it's like a genetic predisposition that might lend itself towards alcoholism because you see patterns in families. And so that's why in the book of Galatians, it says, um, cursed is he who hung on a tree so that he became a curse to remove the curse. What that means is that generational curses are broken by Jesus Christ. Why though? Because he was tempted in every way. He was tested in every way, but he refused to sin, therefore remaining spotless and spotless and without blemish. And so when he died, it wasn't the temporary covering of an, of an innocent instinctual animal. It was the permanent covering of another man that was 100% man, but 100% God that secured your salvation. Is anybody thankful for a permanent solution to sin? So there are, se- it's a sevenfold sprinkling of the blood though. So, and this will help you. So for those of you who are taking notes, follow me. Number one, 
His blood was shed seven times, just like you see in Leviticus, because it's a type and a shadow. Number one, Gethsemane. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down from the ground. Let's stop there. Did you ever stop to realize that the first time Jesus' blood was shed was not from another human being doing it, but rather the anguish and the anxiety of his own mind? Oh, you're getting a revelation. His blood was shed in Gethsemane. His sweat, it, it said that it literally began to turn to blood. Why? Because as this precious lamb was being sacrificed, he was ensuring that your mind can be washed by that same blood and you can be free from any and all internal pressures. So even when there's not an external threat, but the internal threat is wearing you down. Some of you have panic attacks. Some of you hyperventilate. Some of you have an anxiety. Some of you have health anxiety, financial anxiety, relational anxiety. Some of you struggle to be in crowds that are too big, and it's a mental thing. Even when the external threat doesn't exist, the internal threat, and Jesus, when he was in Gethsemane, thinking about what goes before him, his sweat turned to blood because as the pressure lamb, the sacrifice started, the first sprinkling started then, so that you can be free in your mind. You don't need to vape. You can't smoke your way out of it. You can't drink your way out of the alcohol. See, here's the, here's what I'm trying to explain. When, whenever you use a pill, a drug, or a cigarette, it's something external coming internal to actually fix the internal. But when the blood came out of Jesus, it was something internal coming external to Solve what was internal. So when the blood is sprinkled upon your mind, honey, you don't have to worry about your future because your future is fixed because of the blood. When you're worried about, some, come on, somebody, what's on the inside will be washed. And that was Gethsemane. We've got to get a revelation of the blood because therapeutic preaching will, will resolve anxiety temporarily, but preaching on the blood will wash it eternally. We, we don't understand the blood. Number two, the crown of thorns. This is deep. This, I'm telling you, I've waited years. I feel like the Lord finally gave this to me, and it's for this hour. What do they believe about the blood? Number two, the crown of thorns. Matthew chapter 27, verse 29. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it, they. If you have your Bibles, you can circle the word they. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, hail king of the Jews. The spirit of accusation inside of them put a crown on him and then mocked him as a king. Same demons, new day. <laughs> so here's what you need to understand. When the threat is internal in Gethsemane, the blood comes out of Jesus to say, I've washed your mind from the internal. But when they put a crown 360 degrees of thorns on your head and they are pressuring you externally, the blood begin to come out of the lamb because he was saying, even when they try to infiltrate and get the thorns into your mind, my blood is a blood barrier for your mind. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody. When you hear them on the news, when you hear them at your job, when you hear them at your home, when they press the crown of thorns upon your head like they did Christ's head, when they begin to torment, oh, who are you? You think you're better than me because you're a Christian. You think you're better than me because you serve Jesus. Oh, you think going to that church makes you holier than them. That same voice of accusation is the voice, the demonic voice that put the crown on Jesus' head. See, what they don't realize is every single one of us are given a crown. So the question is not, do we have a crown? The question is, has you, have you laid it down at Jesus' feet? Have you taken your crown off and laid it on his feet? We've all been given a crown, but where is the crown? Is it on your head or at his feet? 
And so Jesus had that crown of thorns pressed. It was three, and I think about this, it was 360 degrees of pressure. But the blood was spilled, so even when they pressure you, you'll still receive the freedom of the blood. Can I keep going? It gets better. Mark chapter 14, verse 65. At the high priest's house. <laughs> At the high priest. Y'all aren't going to help me preach this one today. I can tell. It, it's 9 a.m. You're tired. You're lethargic. I, your coffee hasn't kicked in. But I'm going to just preach this no matter what today. Because Isaiah chapter. Let me back up. Mark chapter 14, verse 65. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Jesus was physically beat down at, but where was it? It wasn't at the sinner's house. It was at the high priest's house. I'm telling you, I've been in church for a long time, and you will find that you get the best, the best beatdowns from the people parading as high priests. And sometimes in the local church where we fail is you'll get treated better at a bar than you do in a congregation. And Jesus got spit on and beat down at the high priest's house. But I believe that his blood was shed to say that you can survive a beat down in a congregation because I received a beat down in a congregation. Jesus' blood had to be sprinkled. Because, see, we talk about the shedding of the blood, but there are seven ways the blood is sprinkled. And I believe that as his blood was sprinkled at the high priest's house, and you know what? They yelled at him, prophesy, which was mocking his gift. So when Jesus' gift was mocked at the high priest's house and they spit on him and physically punched him, the lamb's blood was sprinkled to say, even when people who claim to be the chosen ones, give you the beat down. My blood is sufficient for that arena. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody right now. The question that's being asked to the entire body of Christ is what do we believe about the blood? Because you see patterns, patterns of redemption and patterns of accusation, patterns of redemption and you see there are those who are crucifying and those who are being crucified. And the thing that I want to encourage you with, because this is probably one of the most encouraging messages I could ever preach, is when you get to all seven sprinklings of the blood of Jesus Christ, which mirror the old covenant sprinklings of the blood of the lamb, what you realize is as Jesus was going through the process of crucifixion, he was ensuring freedom in every domain of our lives. Number four, now the men, I want you to think about this, his beard being plucked. Isaiah chapter 50, verse six, it's, and this is a messianic prophecy that was given in the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 50, verse six, I gave my back to those who strike and I gave my cheeks to those who pull out the beard and I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. I hid not. So Jesus willfully gave. Why? Because when they plucked his beard out and they begin to do this, blood was being sprinkled because what he's saying is what they're doing makes you want to retreat, but what I'm doing will make you take territory. See, we have a prophet in our house, a great man of God named Kevin Haas. And this morning, a, a great man of God, this morning without knowing my message, he literally did the dream team huddle and he said, guys, on three, I want us to say, take, take territory. My jaw dropped. I was like, how does he know? But see, what happened is the way they were treating Jesus, the temptation would be to shrink back. Don't pull on my beard. Don't spit in my face. But instead, he says, I gave them my cheeks. 
I stepped into that moment. And I think what happens when you become a Christian is that when you face persecution on your job, when you, when Gen Z, when you face persecution in the school system, the Babylonian school system that wants to wreck your mind with the, uh, the, with the ideals and philosophies of demons, instead of backing down, you step forward like Jesus. And you say, if I'm gonna be made fun of in this school, it's gonna be for the sake of Christ because I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them my cheek. Go ahead and do whatever you can do because the blood empowers me to step forward when I want to step back. We're taking territory. Number five, in John chapter 19, verse one, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. We have an election that's coming up here in America. When Jesus was flogged by Pilate, what he was saying is, there are gonna be times when your government does not do what's righteous, but that doesn't mean you don't stand for righteousness sake. And so as a church, the blood of Jesus empowers us to be flogged by political powers and to endure that just like Jesus did. Because forget about red and blue, the only red we're here to claim is the blood of Jesus. <laughs> And, and we're not going to be a church come November that's divided by political party. We're going to be united by the blood of the lamb. And this is, I'm getting up ahead of it because he was flogged by Pilate saying that even when the government allows these things to happen, we will endure. Number six, Psalm chapter 22, verse 16 says, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. In Psalms chapter 22, verse 16, these dogs are human beings. So the Bible calls evildoers that have circled around Jesus dogs. The Bible. Why? Let me tell you why. Because just like my dog, I'm the only one in our family that feeds star table food. Some of you are guilty of the same thing. And I like to, I test him. Now I've made him throw up a few times, but he survived it. So whenever we're eating, he comes up to me and he just sits at my feet. Why? Because he's waiting for a scrap. He's waiting for something to fall from the table. Can I just give you some wisdom in life? There are dogs that have been trained to wait for scraps to fall off the table. And see, you gotta ask yourself, are you a son or a daughter or a dog? Are you sitting at the table feasting in the presence of your enemies? Or are you a dog waiting for some kind of scrap to fall off the table to talk about? And see, what happens is he's saying there are dogs that are literally encompassing Jesus. And he says, they pierce my hands and feet. But what does that mean? It means that there is redemption for the sins you've done with your hands and there is redemption for the sin that you've done to run. The Bible says that God hates certain things and one of the things that God hates explicitly in scripture are those who run to do sin. So I don't think it's strange that his feet were pierced so that all the times we've used our feet to walk in the direction of sin, he says, I've empowered you to turn around and walk back to the table and to sit at the table of promise that I've secured for you. And number seven, the seventh sprinkling is the spear in his side. John chapter 14 verse, or John chapter 19 verse 34. He was pierced in his side, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. What does this mean, Pastor Mike? As that spear went into his heart and it was said as that it was as if blood and water came out, his heart became unoffendable so that your heart could be unoffendable. That water was the washing of a baptism. That you go into that water and you come out washed you come out pure, that blood secures. Did you know that you can have an undefendable heart? 
that nothing that's said, that nothing that they do can even offend you. Why? Because you're so secure in who he has called you and what he's called. You're so secure in the blood. You understand the fullness of the blood, what the blood declares about you, what the blood says about you, that the blood is, is testifying a different story. And what begins to happen is you say, I have been crucified to the world and the world has been crucified to me. If I boast in anything, it's the cross because I know who I am through the blood. I know who I was without the blood. I knew who I was before the blood, but I know what happened when the seven sprinklings of blood came upon me. I can give you my cheek, pull out my beard, spit on me. I can walk into it instead of stepping back because the blood. There are areas in life I used to think I can't step into that. If you would have told me that my wife and I could even teach on the topic of marriage, I would say I'm unqualified. But the blood says, Mike, tell the story of redemption. It's about the blood. It's not about our marriage. It's about what the blood did to our marriage. Some of you are like, well, I don't know if I can tell my story. Don't tell your story. Tell the story of what the blood did to your story. It's always been about the blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. So help me understand it. Are y'all still with me in this Bible study we're doing? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the life. So in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, they believe that, okay, watch this. We're coming to a close right now. They believed that the life of the animal was in the blood. So if Mary conceived Jesus by the Holy Spirit overshadowing her, and then Jesus is 100% man through the lineage of, of Mary, but 100% God conceived by the Holy Spirit. They would have believed that, believed, and we believe that the blood of Jesus carries the life of God. Do, is it clicking now? That the blood of Jesus carried the life of God. And the way that you get the life of God out is the blood has to be sprinkled. And they would have understood, according to Leviticus, it would have been sprinkled seven different ways. But Pastor Mike, how do you sprinkle the blood? How do I, have you ever heard old Pentecostals say, I plead the blood? That's biblical. What they're actually saying is I apply the blood because the blood would have been put in a basin. So they would have killed the animal and as they pierced that animal and the, the blood would drain out into a basin, but they had to apply the blood because the blood in the basin doesn't do anything, but the blood over you, come on. So in the Passover, they said, now watch this. In the, I got chills all over me. In the Passover, they said the blood will be in the, pa the basin and take hyssop. Hyssop was a weed that grow, grew all throughout the region. Take that weed called hyssop, you know, just like a, a common branch and you dip it in the basin and it, watch, this is what it said. Apply it on the, uh, the threshold of the door, not down at the bottom because nobody tramples over the blood, but put the blood over you you and then nothing will be able to pass past the blood see there's a revelation here but the blood in the basin does nothing you have to apply the blood who wants to know how to apply the blood now I want us at every location right now I want to start with our men because when you read the Passover story do you know whose job it was to take that branch of hyssop and dip it in the basin and apply it? It wasn't the woman's job. Sorry, ladies. It wasn't the children's job. It was the man's job to apply the blood. You know, we always talk about in this church, women are rising. You want to know why? Because our men are all already standing. Where the men are already standing, the women are rising. 
we have some men at this church who know how to apply the blood over their family who know how to take it out of the basin and say i'm gonna leave and the people you'll have the most problems with in the local church are the ones where the woman leads but the husband's not applying the blood over the family i rebuke that spirit of jezebel in jesus name we have men who will rise up and apply the blood over their family and women rise where men are already standing do we got some men in this house who are standing for jesus across every location let me see the men standing up hallelujah yeah everybody else just stand to your feet we're about to close this thing down but when I look at the Santis family, I see a, a man who is willing to take the blood out of the basin and put it on. And I see his sons playing instruments and shepherding a location on Long Island. This is why the devil hates V1 Church because we have strong men who will apply the blood. And you can hear the taunts of the spirit of death, but it's gonna be on the outside of our house because the blood says you can't get on the inside. The blood says back up. Okay, with everybody on your feet, we're about to pray because I feel the anointing. How do you apply the blood? Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, and they conquered him. Who's him? The accuser of the brother and Satan. How did they conquer him? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But this is the best part. And everybody leaves. How many of you have heard this scripture that they overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony? Okay, wait, wait. Did you know that's not the whole scripture? The most important part is the one everybody leaves out. It says comma, put that script. Oh, it's down there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, forget it, forget it, forget it. Go back. <laughs> Let's put it in the middle of the screen for next service. I promise we're professionals. So it says, comma, for they love not their life unto death. You know what that means? They were willing to die. They did not care about anything else. They were 100% committed. And because they love not their life unto death, it says that this is the two things it said that they did. They told their testimony and they love not their life unto death. And because of that, they sprinkled the blood and the devil was defeated forevermore. And so Pastor Mike, how do I sprinkle the blood over my life and my family? I'm gonna tell you how. 100% commitment. We love not our life unto death. I am not a Long Islander. I am a Christian on Long Island. I am not a New Yorker. I am a Christian in New York. And I love not my life unto death. I'm not living for a paycheck because he paid it all. I'm not living for a house because if in my father's house there are many mansions. I know that the blood purchased everything for me. And it's the blood that declares a different story. And we tell our testimony. Oh, seven sprinklings of the blood. And we 100% commit. And why do we keep telling our testimony? To keep shutting them up. The Apostle Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. We're about to pray. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontius, Galatia, Asia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit by obedience to Jesus Christ for the sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So Peter is saying, as we are obedient to Christ, he says, it's for that and the sprinkling with his blood that grace and peace may it be multiplied to you. Then when you look at Hebrews chapter three, verse one, therefore, holy brothers, 
I like that I like that adjective holy brothers it insinuates that there were some among them who were not holy we've got some unholy brothers in the body of Christ today don't we but he says therefore holy brothers who you share in a heavenly calling consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession how many of you are thankful that Jesus is our apostle that Jesus is leading this church that Jesus is shepherding the shepherds all the way down the line it's Jesus he says upon this rock I've started this thing he told Peter not even the gates of hell will prevail because above every apostle is the apostle Jesus Christ himself and because he's leading it cannot fail somebody shout the word redemption somebody shout the word cleansing Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace their grace there is redemption number two there is cleansing when the blood is applied first John chapter 1 verse 7 but if we walk in the light somebody shout the word if it's conditional if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another somebody shout one another the only reason why we break fellowship is when we're not walking in the light but when we walk in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin somebody shout all sin You might sin differently than me, and I might sin differently than you, but when we walk in the light together, we receive the cleansing of the blood from all sin. There is nothing in your bloodline more powerful than the blood of Jesus. There's nothing that your great grandparents did that is more powerful than what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. In the body of Christ, the question has been asked, what do you believe about the blood? I'm going to be shouting this all day today. Did the blood make a bad person better? Or did the blood make you wash clean and justify just if I had never done it? We got to stop treating church like it's therapy. It's not therapy. We are not getting better. We were bought and we are going to be resurrected with the saints. I'm I'm, going to keep preaching this. What do you believe? I want you to hear my voice in your head all week with the voice of the Holy Spirit asking you, what do you believe about the blood? What do you believe about the blood? What do you believe about the blood? One drop was enough for your entire family, but he sprinkled it seven different ways. One drop was enough for your entire workplace, but he sprinkled it seven ways. One drop was enough for this entire country, but he sprinkled it seven different ways. Watch, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Let's take a moment, and I want you to remove the distractions. Because there are some areas that his blood flows to the lowest valley. I said his blood flows to the lowest valley. And the vision I have in the spirit right now, when you pour water down the mountain, it goes into the lowest part, into the cracks and crevices. There are some things that you've done that you have not allowed the blood to flow into it. And you've said, God, I can't, you can forgive me, but I can't forgive me. And the Lord says, what do you believe about my blood? Some of you have been saying, I feel so dry. I feel so cracked. And this Lord says, yes, I'm letting the blood in every area. The blood. Demons hate preaching about the blood. Flesh hates preaching about the blood. What do you believe about the blood? Maybe you received it four sprinklings, but there's some more. 
There's seven sprinklings. So here's what I want to declare as we're in this moment. I'm going to begin to declare over you all seven sprinklings. And if you need to receive the blood of Jesus in this area of your life, as I go through them, just lift your hand and let me begin to pray for you. Number one, the sprinkling of the blood for Gethsemane in the area of internal thoughts. Who needs that? A washing and internal thoughts. Father, I pray that you wash us with your blood. In the internal thoughts, I feel freedom. <laughs> wow, I feel such a wave of freedom right now across every location. Oh, I feel the blood just washing minds right now. Number two, external. How many of you are facing external? The crown of thorns, 365 degrees, 360 degrees around your mind. Right now, in the name of Jesus, receive the washing of the blood from external forces on your mind. It's your dad, it's your kids, it's your husband, it's your wife. This external pressure. How many of you need freedom from the high priest's house? You've gotten a beat down. They've ridiculed you for your calling. It's, it's other Christians who've wounded you. Who needs the blood of Jesus sprinkled at the high priest's house right now? Lift your hands and let them wash you. You can give your cheek. You can give your other cheek because you're a dead man walking. You're a dead woman walking. Receive the blood in the high priest's house. Beard plucked. How many of you need that? That you want to hide in disgrace and you feel the voice of accusation telling you be disgraced, be ashamed. And the message that I come today is shame off of you. The world says shame on you, but the blood says shame off of you. I'm here to declare the blood says shame off of you. Every demon of shame and condemnation, I break your power and command you to loose them now in the name of Jesus. Scourged by Pilate. Politics at work. How many of you need the blood? Politics at school. Politics in family. How many of you need forgiveness for the hands and feet? You keep going back to what you've done. You keep going back to what you've ran into sin and the devil's tormenting you. Receive the sprinkling of the blood on your hands and feet. How many of you need this last one? An unoffendable heart. Unoffendable heart. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, that the blood and water that came out of your side will begin to wash our hearts. The hyssop, we apply the blood. Now everyone right now, let's pray this together. We're getting ready to sing and we're gonna sing triumphantly. We're gonna sing, sing as a conquering congregation that believes in the fullness of the blood. Come on, I want everybody to clear this with me. Say, I apply the blood over my life, over my household. I plead the blood over my mind, over my hands and feet, over my future, over my past. I receive the seven sprinklings of the blood of the Lamb. Now say it boldly, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I am free in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship, let's worship.